So let me dive in. Thank you for that very fascinating paper, Julie. It's uh, an honor to be invited and to be a part of this. I wish I was with you in person. Um, thank you to Ben for organizing what appears to be a very, very fascinating and um, tech savvy uh, conference. Okay. So my purpose in this paper is to introduce you all uh, to the Japanese Marxist uh, philosopher Kojin Karatani, uh, whose work is becoming more and more uh, known, I think. Um, I know that Slavoj Žižek sort of put him on the map um, in his, his book on the parallax, uh, which was a sort of Karatanian uh, idea. But my, my purpose here is actually to interrogate <clears throat> Karatani's theory of history um, uh, through libidinal economy. And I believe that uh, libidinal economy is actually an under-theorized area of his wider uh, project. Uh, however, uh, he makes subtle allusions to very important psychoanalytic concepts, such as superego and death drive, as the wider logic of his theory of historical change and uh, to the wider sort of presentation of how he theorizes periodization. Um, let me just start by, by pointing out a, what, I, what I consider to be one of the most important critiques that his thought offers us, and that is a critique of historical materialism, particularly historical materialism as it blossomed in the 20th century. Um, one of the sort of signature aspects of historical materialism uh, in the 20th century was that the categories of the state and the nation were largely understood as superstructure and not base effects of society. Therefore, revolutionary so socialism from uh, Mao's uh, uh, cultural revolution to uh, Leninism uh, in Russia insisted on a form of socialism uh, that would exist beyond this, the nation state in ideal form, yet, as we know, they were unable to dissolve these categories of social life. One of the arguments that Karatani makes is that they were unable to locate a revolution at the level of modes of exchange. And um, I want to talk uh, briefly about that before I begin my formal uh, remarks. So historical materialism and its emphasis on modes of production over that of exchange um, created a dynamic whereby um, transformations in the nation and the state sphere of life were reduced to aesthetic forms of resistance. Revolution was not promote, proposed at the level of exchange or at the level of the base. Therefore, overcoming imaginary structures of the nation and the state were conceived of largely through an act of enlightenment, through a representational structure, through education and the proper education of the masses, the proper cultivation of a vanguard, and so on. However, this task left untouched for the most part, or at least did not privilege, the question of how precisely to revolutionize the primary mode of exchange. When these revolutionary movements achieve the seizure of the state, the nation, and the economy, the spheres of liberty and fraternity, which were thought as extensions of the superstructure, and thus were thought to be rooted in the base, material relations, were thought to have therefore been able to wither vis-a-vis -vis a larger project of education. Um, however, what actually occurred in these movements, as we know full well, was that capital held hegemony over social relations within the sphere of the nation and the state. Thus, the wider premise of historical materialism was in many ways proven wrong. Against this conception, Karatani argues that state and nation must be understood as extensions of a base. So how exactly does Karatani think the exchange? Let me share with you a, what I hope is a helpful diagram. Can you all see that? Good. So in his text, The Structure of World History, Modes of Exchange, he discusses these four modes of exchange that have governed societies throughout world history. These different modes are similar to the Borromean knot in that their structures are intermeshed within any given social or even civilizational configuration. To summarize them briefly, we have mode A, what he names reciprocal exchange or gift exchange, which is premised on the idea of reciprocity. This mode is composed of 
tribal gift giving forms of exchange where there exists a series of mini systems, but no larger federation or state sovereign. Mode B arises as exchange governed by a sovereign in which you have many empires such as in feudalism. The sovereign therefore becomes the principle which dictates all exchange across the social arrangements. Uh, mode B is the birth of the social contract. Uh, so he often associates thinkers to these uh, uh, emergent points and Thomas Hobbes would be the thinker associated with mode B. Mode C is of course commodity exchange in which the sovereign is no longer embodied in the Hobbesian sovereign king but becomes money itself. In essence, the accumulation of money and the exchange system it develops under the money form takes the place of the sovereign. Karatani writes that mode of exchange C or commodity exchange, quote, acquires an objectivity that transcends human will. Mode D is a regulative mode that combines A and D. It therefore transcends the other three and returns to a higher mode of A. So you have a certain teleological theory of history, which for many of you might make your skin crawl, but uh, stick with it. Um, so each mode has developed distinct spheres from the communal, communal to the state to the, mar to the market to the fourth mode, which functions as a sort of negation of the, of the former three. I want to hone in here on mode D. In various places, Karatani discusses mode D as religion, and it, whereas in other areas he refers to it as something which is provoked by social repression or the Freudian death drive. Karatani theorizes communism as a returning demand to break from mode C. Mode D thus occurs as a demand wherein genuine freedom, equality, and fraternity are demanded. It is therefore a negative religion that seeks to break apart the prior three modes. So this is a, a crazy uh, demonstration of the Borromean knot that Karatani develops. Can you all see the, the writing or yes? So uh, don't pay attention to Foucault and Althusser and these other figures, but pay attention to the, the, the three-part structuring, which you'll notice uh, mirrors the three demands of the French Revolution. You see, so the sphere of equality, of fraternity, of freedom um, become intermeshed. So the logic of Modi is a, uh, a sort of uh, paradoxical uh, supplement. Okay, I hope I hope that visual is helpful. An example of Modi in history occurs, according to Karatani, with the rise of Socrates in ancient Greece. Socrates was presenting a form of universal equality, what in Greek is called isonomia, which he placed at the center of his teachings as an example uh, of reciprocal mode of exchange. So you see here that. Uh, the, the notion of reciprocal exchange is not merely reducible to economic uh, logics of equivalency, but also uh, is absolutely thought within thought, but also within social relations. Um, the institution of a common currency in Socrates' time uh, means that the world in which Socrates was living in was actually uh, uh, orientated in a primitive mode C commodity exchange. So the scandal of Socrates could be considered um, as a, in the context of a kind of sort of pre-capitalist or proto-capitalist uh, logic of the mode of exchange under mode C. So while mode D is a regulative idea of revolution that occurred prior to the rise of capitalism, Karatani argues that within capitalism, it was Kant, Immanuel Kant, who really discovered mode, of D, mode D in his ethics, specifically in the categorical imperative. The categorical imperative is only truly possible in a society where its form of exchange goes against mode C, commodity exchange, because the very notion of treating others always as ends and not as means is not truly possible in a mode of exchange where commodity is, exchange is paramount. Kant's ethics therefore promoted a form of associationism, which consists of the return of reciprocal exchange in a higher dimension. This interpretation of Kant differs, of course, from John Rawls's distributionist reading of Kant, where the mode of justice that 
other liberal commentators emphasize, uh, this mode of thinking uh, Kantian categorical imperative and Kantian ethics that Karatani introduces relies on exchange and not distribution as the primary mode of the dispensation of justice. Thus, in order to think the categorical imperative, i.e. by treating persons and future persons as means, implies that society must enter into associationist relations and must therefore reject the uh, merchant capital structure of Kant's time. Marx, similar to Kant, argued that communism will be the realization of free associations. This means that Kant, according to Karatani, and again, this may make your skin crawl, becomes the first proto-Marxist. Karatani argues Marx shared uh, uh, this uh, view of the state of associationism, particularly the early Marx. And his reading of Kant, one of the consequences of it is that we have a theory of cosmopolitanism, which is premised on the absence of the state. So uh, this is very important. Uh, Im importantly, for our wider conversation on libidinal economy, Kant argued that the essence of human nature lies in what he names unsocial sociability, or the idea that communal bonds and communal ties are driven by fundamental antagonisms that are bound up within nature. This is a concept which very much sounds like what Freud would eventually formalize as the death drive. So this notion of antagonism links Kant up with the, with the wider psychoanalytic and libidinal economy project. Kant writes, quote, man has an inclination to associate with others because in society he feels himself to be more than man, in essence as more than the developed form of his natural capacities. So here you have in the Kantian uh, idea of history from a cosmopolitan point of view in the fourth thesis, a notion of this antagonism which produces in excess. So this idea of what he calls unsocial sociability, combined with Kant's emphasis on overcoming the oppressive mode of merchant capitalism, means that Kantian ethics can only truly be thought in a social arrangement not dictated by mode C. This argument allows us to see Kant's framework of history and ethics as one deeply linked to the vision of a future in which nations and state dissolve into a federation of communes no longer reliant on the state form. This critique of Kant also offers a fascinating rejoinder to historical materialism and its privileging of the superstructure over base. We should read this move as a fascinating critique of representational politics. In essence, while mode D is thought along the lines of a Kantian regulative idea, that is an idea that cannot be represented, the link to libidinal economy comes about in that the movement toward reciprocal gift or back to mode A, what Kant called associationism, it deals with this fundamental death drive or unsocial sociability at the core of any communal configuration. The very notion of world peace, of communism, of the world republic, etc., are all made possible not by human reason or the moral uh, will, but rather by unsocial sociability. So the logic and the motor of history is driven by this excessive death drive force. Okay. Another name for this unsocial sociability uh, is, of course, death drive. However, Karatani does not discuss this in great detail. So part of what I want to, to continue with is sort of what might that uh, thesis look like? <clears throat> I argue that it is better to think of death drive not as a standalone regulative idea, but rather to link death drive in a dialectical relationship to the Freudian category of the superego and to locate the way in which the superego and death drive interact. The pleasure principle is replaced by the death drive for Freud because, quote, we desire the object as absent. Actually obtaining the object produces dissatisfaction, not enjoyment. So thus I want to argue that it is the superego that is rejected in the thrust of the unsocial sociability, which is the logic, or if you like, the motor of history. Reciprocal exchange, or modi, becomes a form of exchange that is important precisely because it is a form of a type of a rejection of the superego, because it seeks to enact a latent desire for a return to more localized forms of social exchange, to forms that precisely seek an obliteration or a starting over from the dominance of commodity logic. 
One way to think about this in our own time would be to reference the work of Joshua Clover in his book, Riot Strike Riot, which theorizes our age of insurrections globally from Black Lives Matter to Occupy Wall Street, even to alter globalization as, quote, circulation struggles. So if they are struggles, not so much at the factory or the labor relation, they are struggles in the sphere of exchange. Thus, we are very much in a stage where Modi is seeking a rebirth, if you like. However, uh, the logic of Modi as a mode of overturning superego also means that we must discuss repression and the repetition compulsion, compulsion as a generator of historical time as well. Modi is not merely a sublimation of this repetition compulsion. The drive to sublimate is, is the same drive as that is tied to surplus. So in some sense, I'm not wanting to think of this as a sublimation. I'm thinking of this as something which actually uh, finds an outside, uh, finds a, uh, locates desire outside of the configuration. Freud did not originally conceive the superego as a consequence of the notion of death drive. Taking the superego into consideration, unsocial sociability rather is thought as intrinsically enmeshed with the notion of death drive. The superego is an inward aggressivity that can inhibit externalized aggressivity. As Lacan argues in seminar one, quote, the superego gives access to the root of the law itself, to that which is no longer of the order of language, but which nevertheless lies at the core of the commanding character of the law insofar as nothing more than its root remains. Thus, the idea of the superego is no longer thought in a purely negative manner, but is rather thought as a way of reconfiguring the very edifice of the law as such. So after Freud develops the idea of an aggressivity that exceeds the pleasure principle in his revamped idea of the death drive and beyond the pleasure principle, he also develops a theory of the death drive as what we might call a libidinal noumenon, a, a libidinal noumenon is actually a way to link this unsocial sociability back into the Kantian transcendental framework. Uh, this means that death drive is now thought as being capable of bringing about effects at subjective and collective levels that come from within inside the group. There is thus a dialectical relationship between the death drive and its potential to reconfigure uh, a superego uh, relation in society. Why is it useful to think of this dialectic as aiming towards the enactment of reciprocal forms of exchange? As we know, the theory of the gift in the anthropological literature is largely a way to account for the psychological dimension of primitive societies. The fact that tribal societies and pre-feudal societies had extensive and complex gift economies show that you have the potential for an economy beyond egoism. Marcel Mauss, whose uh, the, the gift is probably the most emblematic of this literature, assumes the gift exchange largely has to do with social solidarity and the potential for social solidarity, in essence, that we must learn something from gift economies precisely about the potential for solidarity in our own time. But as an aside, I think it's important to note that Marcel Mauss was not a communist and was, in fact, a state bureaucrat who was deeply suspicious of the Bolsheviks' refusal to pay the debts of the Tsar after they overthrew the Tsar. He wanted to maintain a certain capitalist mode of exchange and perhaps implement the gift merely in the form of a common wisdom. This is not the case with the communist thinker Kojin Karatani, who sees in gift exchange a non-representable upsurge and movement of communism, which is, as Marx described, equivalent to the movement towards the abolition of all things. Other psychoanalytic thinkers such as Norman O. Brown have turned to gift exchange in their own analysis of history. In Life Against Death, Brown points out that the need to give is tied to the psychology of non-enjoyment. Thus, gift exchange is based on a taming of the pleasure principle and its derivative effects of anxiety, masochism, the repetition compulsion, and the death drive itself. More recently, Bernard Stiegler, has argued uh, a very provocative thesis apropos the existence of the superego in late industrial capitalist societies like our own. 
And his argument is basically that the current configuration of society has lost its capacity precisely to resurrect forms of superego. And he argues that psychoanalysis, largely as an institution, has been unable to recover from this fact. I want to quote Stiegler. As libidinal energy, desire is produced by that apparatus that transforms the drives into investments in objects via binding systems that are at once superegoic and sublimatory. And these cannot be separated. There is no superego with figures with whom to identify without those identificatory figures produced by sublimation. The question being to know whether the reverse is also true. So uh, there's something quite uh, damaging to a social situation where the dialectic between superego and death drive is somehow stunted. And I think that in the lost spirit of capitalism and in the symbolic misery series, you'll see some very nice uh, theorizations of that uh, impasse. Um, how am I doing on time? Do I have a uh, couple minutes? Sorry? Five minutes, okay. So I have a next section that I'm not going to um, examine because I look at Deleuze and Guattari and Lyotard uh, uh, and their own under theorization of exchange um, and, and ways in which the Karatani uh, model might actually supplement some of the libidinal eco uh, economic theories from the 1970s. But let me actually just conclude with a conversation about praxis. Uh, from the Cartanian point of view. What might a praxis that emphasizes modes of exchange over that of production look like? It is first important to ask whether there is effective resistance to capital at the level of the mode of production. Because if you take seriously the governing hegemony of mode C, you will understand that the proliferation of mode C extends to all areas of reproductive life as well as labor. Thus, resistance within the sphere of circulation becomes the preferred site of struggle and contestation. Because, and this will evoke the philosophical orientation of Kartani, because the subject is most free outside of the labor relation. So thus, uh, waging struggles within the sphere of circulation promotes the realization of proletarian subjectivity from a standpoint of freedom. So you see the biases he has towards a kind of Kantian idea of the subject, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> tactically, what might that look like? Well, of course, that would involve things like the boycott. Uh, however, you run into a risk that the idea of the boycott is very limited um, to consumer capitalism. Um, however, in some of the work that I've followed that he's done in Japanese society in his own home, um, he's thinking of the boycott in a much more total way, and he's actually in, uh, compelling people to fundamentally create alternative uh, e economic exchange relations. And so he extends this, uh, if you like, in a more total way. Um, at the level of the how the logic of exchange would link to the nation and the state, uh, one of the ways that that might function would be uh, the promotion of forms of gift exchange in the free sharing of technology, in um, uh, the free disarming of, of nuclear weapons and things things of this nature at the level of, of the state. Um, so in essence, I think that this uh, uh, edifice, this, this very, very robust um, theory of history that he provides us um, has something to teach us, particularly about um, some of the heirs of 20th century uh, historical materialism, but also ways to link it to, to libidinal uh, economy as well. Thank you.